The Bible describes a global flood about 1600 years after creation. This week on Creation Magazine Live, the consequences of a global flood. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. And our topic this week is evidence that supports a global flood. Um, what are some of the lasting results, results that we could investigate today that are the consequences of a global flood around two, uh, 2500 BC as the Bible records? Right. Now, now, last year we did an episode on evidence that the flood was global, not local. Right. Uh, it, it's fashionable in some Christian circles today to try to make the flood of Noah into just a little flood. Yeah. Uh, but that just isn't supported biblically. For details, you can watch that episode online at creation.com slash cml4-24. And uh, that was a fun episode to do. Yeah. Well, we can start by asking, uh, what would a global flood do? Firstly, it would cause massive right. erosion of the existing land surface and deposition of the eroded uh, sediment. And it would do that on a global scale, since it's a global flood. Global flood, right, right, yeah. So a global flood would impact our understanding of geology, the study of rock formations. Secondly, it would bury plants and animals on a global scale. Uh, that would affect our understanding of the fossil record, which is paleontology. Um, and thirdly, it would restart human history, so it would affect our understanding of ancient history and the origin of nations. Right. It would affect other yeah. things as well. Um, we're just going to focus on these three areas over the, over the next half hour. Okay, so instead of another way, denying a global flood will lead to misinterpretations of data in geology, paleontology, and ancient history. Right. If you don't take a global flood into account, you likely won't get correct conclusions in these areas, and we'll show you how that works. And, and let, let's, let's break this down a little bit further. What would we expect to find in these three areas if there was a global flood? In geology, right. we would expect to find sedimentary rock showing evidence of rapid deposition. We'd also expect to find large-scale geologic features, continent-wide geologic features. In paleontology, we would expect to find fossils showing evidence of uh, rapid and recent burial involving evidence that they were buried alive. Right. We'd expect yeah. to find a general pattern to the fossil record matching uh, different ecological areas with exceptions. A global flood would mix many things together, but there'd be a, a certain amount of sorting going on. So we would expect a general pattern, but we should also uh, find exceptions to that pattern because uh, the flood was, after all, a catastrophic event. It was, right. <laughs> In ancient history, we would expect to find evidence that human population and ancient nations began about 4,500 years ago. So let's begin, let's go back to the top of the list. In geology, do we see evidence that sedimentary rock was deposited rapidly? Absolutely. Here's a, here's a picture, have a look at this. I took this when I was rafting through the Grand Canyon. Notice the tightly bent layers of rock. These layers were deposited horizontally, and then some uplift occurred, tilting the strata on, on the right side of the picture there, nearly vertical. The, these layers, the, the entire thickness that you're seeing here, must have been deposited rapidly then, not long afterwards, the uplift occurred, which bent the still soft layers. It didn't break them. It just bent them. If the sediments had been laid down over eons of time, they would have, been, they would have lithified. They would have turned to hardened into solid rock. And, and the rock would be broken, not bent. This is evidence for rapid deposition. Right. And here's a fossilized tree-like plant extending through multiple layers of rock. Obviously, the entire thing must have been buried rapidly. If it was buried over millions of years, the top of the tree would have uh, rotted. Right. It, it wouldn't have been fossilized. Here's another picture of a fossilized tree extending through multiple layers of rock with the base of the tree in a coal seam. This is from Tennessee. This is evidence that the tree, the material that has uh, since turned to coal, and the sediment that encased the rest of the tree were all deposited before the tree rotted. If there was a global flood, this is exactly the kind of thing that we would expect to find. Right, and, and that's what we find. We are commonly told that similarities between living things prove that they are related by evolution. But did you know that many similarities found in nature defy evolution? 
Take for example the marsupial mouse and the placental mouse. These creatures are remarkably similar, but according to evolutionists, they did not inherit this startling similarity from a common ancestor. Instead, we are told, evolution achieved the same design in both creatures independently. They call this convergence, because evolution has supposedly converged on, or arrived at, a similar looking outcome. But convergence is really just a word used to try to explain away similarities that don't support evolution. Indeed, convergences are so common in nature that they cause major problem for evolutionists, but they fit nicely with the proposal that the living world is the handiwork of a single divine designer. The similarities tell us that there is one mind behind it all. He even designed things in a way that thwarts evolutionary storytelling. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, welcome back. If you've just tuned in, this week we're talking about evidence for a global flood. In geology, we just talked about this, we would expect to find uh, large-scale geologic features, and that's exactly what we find. Uh, if we go back to Grand Canyon, here you can see a cross-section of the layers of rock. The canyon is on the right side there. Some of the layers exposed there at Grand Canyon can be traced to England. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. So this is sediment deposited on a massive scale. Again, some of the, the, la the, the one of the very lowest layers, the Tapete Sandstone, can be yeah. traced to England. What kind of a process lays that down? Exactly. Well, a global flood. A would. global it's, process. It's, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Another observation at Grand Canyon is that there's been a huge amount, uh, amount of erosion near, yes. the, near the canyon. There's a, a butte called Red Butte. It's about a thousand feet tall, and it preserves some of the layers uh, that used to exist above Grand Canyon and, and have been eroded. So here are some large-scale geologic features, huge deposition of sediments, widespread erosion that would be expected uh, to be found if the flood had happened. Right, yeah. Uh, a common question often associated with the flood is, where did the water come from? Um, you've got a global flood, where did the water come from? Yeah. It's a very popular question. We get that all the time in question times. Yep. Uh, some of you will know the name Jacques Cousteau. And uh, if, you're, if you're, say, under 30 or something, you probably won't. But he did many underwater documentaries. He, he, he basically introduced the world to what was happening in the oceans right. with, his, with his amazing films. He helped develop the Aqualung, which later developed into scuba. Yeah. Uh, now, now, he wasn't a Christian or a creationist, but he knew a lot about the oceans. Yep. This guy knew the oceans. He said that if you were to raise the ocean bottoms so that they're even with the continents, there's enough water in the oceans right now to flood the entire Earth to a depth of more than two miles. So right. where'd the water come from? Still here. The oceans, and still here, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what um, scientists believe was going on during the flood. Rapid yeah. plate tectonics during the flood is a powerful scientific model developed by the world's leading geophysicist on plate tectonic modeling. Yep. Um, we did a, an episode focusing on this model. You can watch it online at creation.com uh, slash CML2-07. So that's Creation Magazine Live, uh, Season 2, Episode 7. Yeah. Uh, that model suggests not only that the continents moved horizontally, so it broke, the original, the original uh, supercontinent broke up, but that the, the ocean floor was actually raised, that there was vertical movement, and that answers the question about where the water came from. The ocean bottoms came up, the water that's in the oceans cover the land. Of course, uh, two miles of water wouldn't cover Everest, for example. Right. Everest yep. is about five and a half <laughs> miles above sea level. Uh, however, Everest is the result of a collision of the Indian plate uh, smashing into the Asian plate, right? Right. Towards the edge yeah. of the flood. And it, it didn't exist before the flood, yeah, so no. those massive upthrusts would have no been... No Everest. Yeah. There, there's fish fossils on the top of Mount Everest. Right. And how did they get there? Fish don't climb mountains. And exactly. Stuff. But <laughs> plate tectonics, that, that model is that that itself has great explanatory power for large-scale geologic features like the, the Himalayan mountain range right. and, and Everest, for example. And it was actually a creationist idea from the beginning. Antonio Snyder was the first to publish on the topic and, and being a creation scientist, he thought that the breakup of the original continent likely had something to do with the flood. The flood. Now, it, it turned, he didn't have the science back then, but it turns out that he was right. Today we have the science that backs up his initial assertion. Exactly. So we do see the large-scale geologic features that we would expect if there was a global flood. Yes. Let's move yep. on to paleontology. In this field, we'd expect to find evidence of rapidly and recently buried plants and animals. So right. um, 
evidence that they, they were not laying around for huge lengths of time, rotting before they were finally buried and became fossils, etc. Uh, here's a fish fossilized in the process of eating its lunch. <laughs> Notice the amazing preservation. It hasn't reached that state of, stage of decomposition where the bones fall apart. It must have been buried rapidly. Yeah, there's, there's an example. Uh, have a look at this. Here's an octopus and a jellyfish fossil. Hmm. Those animals hardly have any hard parts. They're mostly soft tissue. If they wouldn't have been buried quickly, we wouldn't have fossils of octopus and jellyfish today. Right. Uh, what, what's amazing is that scientists see fossils like these all over the world, animals and plants that are beautifully preserved. Right. So very, this, very popular. This is powerful evidence that things were buried very rapidly, but they're looking yep. at these, this evidence, but because they have this powerful paradigm of millions and millions of years, they just automatically assume, well, there must be some kind of process that could do this, and, yeah. and they just, it, it, it's yep. like this huge blind spot. So global, uh, rapidly buried plants and animals is powerful support for a global flood trend, and we'll be back. The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about what we would expect to find if the Bible's account of a global flood is accurate. Right. And so far, scientists are finding exactly what they should find if the Bible is true. It's a That's great right. time to be a Christian. <laughs> so there's lots of evidence for, for rapid burial, right? Yes. What about evidence yeah. for recent burial? Dr. Phil Curry. Uh, world-famous dinosaur hunter. In one of his books on dinosaurs, he said this, bones do not have to be turned into stone to be fossils, and usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. That's an amazing statement. So yeah. the original yeah. biological material, the, the bone is actually still there. Yeah. Uh, of course, biological material doesn't last for, um, you know, uh, back to the evolutionary age of dinosaurs, so it, it seems to be an obvious evidence that he would Right, kind like, of the flag should go up yeah, there. But uh, yeah. actually, over the past 20 years or so, scientists have made some amazing discoveries of things inside these unfossilized dinosaur <laughs> bones. Uh, for example, soft and stretchy tissue, <laughs> blood cells, blood vessels, different kinds of proteins, and, and also, believe it or not, dinosaur DNA. And we've talked about this before. Yeah. Uh, amazing. Evolutionists have been scrambling to make sense of all of this, and so far, all the explanations fall short. Yeah. Uh, some work has been done to try to find support that DNA could last 65 million years, <laughs> back to when these dinosaurs apparently died, because we have dino DNA. Uh, that's when they supposedly went extinct, according to evolution. Right. But if we turn to science and ask, how long could DNA last? Here's the answer. Research has been done. Under ideal conditions, 6.8 million years. 6.8. That's about <laughs> not 10, 65. <laughs> yeah, it's about 10% of, of, of where they need to get to. And, and those ideal conditions include the DNA being frozen solid. Yeah. And you find some of the soft <laughs> tissue in like Hell Creek, Montana. It's in Montana. Yeah. They're finding some of this stuff. So for more information about this, uh, about these amazing discoveries, you can read the article that, uh, that highlights the main points at creation.com slash dino dash DNA. And there's certainly evidence in paleontology supporting the Bible's account of a global flood. Right. What yeah. else would you expect to find in, 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 a, in, a, in the fossil record? Well, as mentioned, we'd expect to find a general pattern to the fossil record with right. exceptions. So what are scientists finding? Well, uh, that's what scientists are finding. <laughs> in, in a global flood, the things buried first would be things living at the bottom of the ocean. Right, that's clams you, don't run really quick. Flood, yeah, they don't run really quick, and just where they, where they live, that's what you'd expect to find. And then upwards from there, then you'd expect uh, fish, and then amphibians, and then reptiles that, that live near the water, and lastly, mammals are things that live near the center of the continents. It, it, it's actually, it's not quite that simple, it's a little more complicated because moving water has a great ability to sort things mm -hmm. by, by size, by shape, and by buoyancy. But given those factors, a global flood would produce a sort of general pattern to the fossil record. Right, but as we mentioned earlier, since it was catastrophic, we should see exceptions to that general pattern. Again, yes. that's exactly what scientists are finding. So here's a picture of the uh, Rorani, 
formation in South America, dated by evolutionists to be about 550 million years old. It contains pollen. According to evolutionary theory, flowering plants that produce pollen didn't evolve for another 390 million <laughs> years. Oops. That's a bit of a problem for evolution, but of course not at all uh, surprising uh, with the biblical account. No, no. Yeah. Uh, another, uh, other out-of-place fossils um, for, for the evolutionists are animals that should not be around at the time of dinosaurs. And we've done shows on this before yep. as well. Uh, paleontologists <clears throat> have found 432 mammal species, that's not just mammals, but mammal species in the dinosaur layers. That's almost as many as the number of dinosaur species. It's incredible. We did an entire episode on this uh, uh, last year called Fossil Mix-Ups. You can view it online at creation.com slash cml4-16. And, and that's going to provide a lot more details than we have time uh, this week to discuss. Right. And, and living fossils, of course, they're, they're another massive problem for the, uh, for the right. evolutionists. But no problem if there was a global flood. Uh, there are fossilized plants and animals that look identical to those living um, today. Uh, right. Here are a few examples yeah. here. Ginkgo trees. Uh, supposedly 125 million years old, according to evolution. Right. Um, yep. Crocodiles, supposedly 140 million years old. Uh, Tuatara lizard, uh, 200 million years. Horseshoe crabs, 200 million years. The lingula, uh, it's lamp shell, it's supposedly 450 million years old. Looks like a, a modern one. Neopilina mollusks, they're supposedly 500 million years old. No change in 500 million years, amazing. <laughs> And there, there's still many other examples of things that show zero evolution over these supposed millions of years. Yeah, but it fits with a global flood. Yeah. Um, why are living th fossils such a big problem for evolution? Because evolutionary history doesn't include a global flood, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> obviously. Right. Um, scientific observations just do not fit the evolutionary account of Earth history. What we see is that the, sci the facts from science beautifully fit the Bible. And I think many Christians sometimes have just not really been exposed to this information or really thought it through. They aren't... Well, where, where are they going to hear it? Right. Where, if, if you don't go to creation.com or go to, go to a CMI event or some creation event, where are you going to hear this? It's not in the textbooks. Right. It's not at the universities. It, it's not taught. Or, yeah, I, I guess, I mean, a lot of times we're referencing evolutionary literature. So in a sense, you could say, well, yeah, it is there. But it's never... The, the data's there. The data's the there. The data's there, but it's always packaged in an evolutionary framework. Right, because it's an anomaly so, in a sense that they're yeah. trying to explain away. And it's usually when people come to a CMI event or something like that, even, even some of the PhD scientists on staff with our ministry, it's at a CMI event where they had all that information brought together and they go, ah, the Bible makes sense. Yeah. We'll be back in just one moment. Atheists in the United Kingdom have launched a public campaign to preach their message of unbelief by using advertising space on public buses. These buses are emblazoned with the slogan, There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Some people find this slogan rather odd. If these atheists are so confident God doesn't exist, why does the slogan say, there's probably no God? Atheists have responded by pointing out that they can't say, there's no God, because that would be taking a faith position. But perhaps even more puzzling is the second part of the slogan that reads, now stop worrying and enjoy your life. This prompted one journalist, skeptical of religious belief, to write, what on earth is there to celebrate? We're talking about death, about not existing, being wiped out forever, and it can happen any time. If that's not cause for worry, what is? It appears atheism is devoid of answers and devoid of hope. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject this week is evidence for a global flood. We've looked at evidence in geology, paleontology, and uh, now let's turn to ancient history. Um, right. According to the Bible, the human population was restarted at the flood with just eight people. And that was about 4,500 years ago. So do we see evidence of that? Absolutely. Uh, we can start by looking at uh, population growth, fairly simple thing. Uh, the current growth rate is 1.1% per year. So th that means for every 100 million people, 1.1 million are added every year. You only need about half a percent to get to 7 billion people, the current population, beginning at the flood about 4,500 years ago. So right. it works out just perfectly. So here's another challenge for evolutionists. If humans began one million years ago, as evolution says, with yeah. a growth rate of only 0 0.01, there would be 10 to the 43 uh, power uh, people today. That's, yeah. a, that's a one with 43 <laughs> zeros behind it. So the evolutionary history is way, way off here, and biblical yeah. history uh, gives the right dates. Yeah. There, there's, there's also strong evidence that the ancient nations originated with Noah's family. 
For example, Mizraim, that, that's one of Noah's grandsons. His name is the Hebrew word for Egypt. Right. Uh, Ashkenaz is a great grandson of Noah. Ashkenaz is the Hebrew word for Germany. Uh, other grandsons of Noah include Canaan. That's uh, familiar probably to most viewers. That's the Hebrew name for the general region later called Palestine. Javan is the Hebrew word for Greece. Kush is the Hebrew word for old Ethiopia. Meshesh is the ancient name for Moscow. And so you see these nations that are tied back to the grandsons of Noah. The biblical names. A, yeah. And, and what about some of the, the timing of when some of these ancient nations uh, began? We can look into yeah. historical records to see if they match the Bible's time frame. Of course they do. In Genesis yeah. uh, 10, 25, the Bible says, To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. This is a reference to the people of the earth being divided when God confused the languages at Babel. According to, to the chronology done by James Usher, the flood took place in 2349 to about 2348 BC. Peleg was born in 2247 BC. Okay, so if we, if we go with that chronology, take Babylon for example. When was it founded? There's an ancient nation, right. an ancient nation of Babylon. In 331 BC, after Alexander the Great had defeated Darius, he went to Babylon. There he received 1,903 years of astronomical observations from the Chaldeans, which they claimed dated back to the founding of Babylon. Right. Now, if that's true, that would place the founding of Babylon in 2234 BC, or about 13 years after the birth of Peleg. That's perfect timing. Right. Talking about the uh, founding of Egypt, the Byzantine historian Constantinus Manassas, uh, who died in AD 1187, wrote that the Egyptian state lasted 1663 years. Okay. So, if correct, then when counting backwards, from 526 BC, when Egypt was conquered, it gives us a year of 2188 BC for the founding of Egypt, and that's about 60 years after the birth of Peleg. Uh, that's a good fit. Yeah, yeah. According to the uh, fourth century bishop and historian Eusebius of Caesarea, the first king of the Greek city of Sicyon, that's west of Corinth, began his reign 1313 years before the first Olympiad, which was in 776 BC. So then Greece was found, according to that, Greece was founded in 2089 BC. That's about 160 years after the birth of Peleg. Again, beautiful fit. <laughs> so in each of these three main areas, scientists and historians are finding ample evidence that supports the Bible's account of a global flood. Yeah. They yeah. find exactly what we'd expect to find, of course, if the Bible's true. Right, yeah. And you're, you're not going to come to correct conclusions <laughs> regarding the fossil record, the, the rock record, the geology, and ancient history if you don't take a global flood into account. It's just not going to work. That's right. You know, we often talk about uh, resources for adults, but we've also got resources for kids, and Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb <laughs> is, uh, is a fantastic book for learning about geology from elementary school ages. Uh, Mr. Hibb uh, make, makes learning geology not only fun, but it's also faith building. So chapters discuss how rocks were formed at creation, reshaped at the flood. It explains how the Ice Age fits with the Bible and, and, a, and a lot more. So. Yeah, and it's also good for adults, actually. Mm -hmm. but as a viewer of Creation Magazine Live, you can get 30% off of this book. Order online at creation.com and use the coupon code CMLHIB. And uh, this, this book is just a fantastic book for kids and adults to learn about geology from the Bible. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each Journal of Creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. All right, welcome back. Uh, this, we're going to talk about a feedback, just to wrap things up here. Um, and uh, this is the, the feedback is, is defending, well, we, we've titled it, Defending Young Earth is Not Biblical. And if you want to follow along, go to creation.com slash defendyec, and you can follow along there. So this is the feedback that we got in. We often get uh, emails into the ministry, and uh, this is how it goes. Uh, I am an evangelist I, and really endorse your ministry. You give me the tools I need to counter the evolutionary arguments I face. I just wanted to say that I don't believe the Bible says the earth is young. It may be young, and I've read many of your articles on scientific evidences supporting this argument, 
as well as your articles on interpreting scripture as saying that it is young. However, I do not believe scripture says this, and I'm concerned that you're trying to defend a position which is not necessary to defend. All your other work is so wonderful that I would not, would not want you to try to defend a position which is not biblical and then maybe lose that argument or have the whole ministry discredited. You don't need to reply to this. It's just a concern of mine that we don't get tied up trying to defend what the Bible doesn't explicitly say. So that's the feedback. Right, and Dr. Carl Wieland responded, you know, and, and I think just before I get into what Carl said here, it's interesting because what he, he starts off saying is he's an evangelist and that we give him the tools needed to counter the evolutionary arguments that he yeah. faces. Yeah. And then he goes on to say that the age of the earth isn't an evolutionary, it isn't an issue. But millions of years is a die on the hill battle for evolutionists. You can't be an evolutionist yeah, right. and not believe in millions of years. <laughs> so what he's missing here right off the bat is that millions of years is part of the evolutionary arguments. It's integral. It if they didn't yeah. have it, they wouldn't have evolution. If, so If you can show evidence that the earth is young, like we've just been doing here. It blows evolution um, out of the water. Evolution's gone, yeah. 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 Anyway, Carl responded this way, some of the things he said. Perhaps it would help you to understand if you put yourself in the position of just having received an email from someone who says, for example, the Bible doesn't teach that God is a trinity. I've looked and looked, but the word trinity doesn't even appear in the Bible. I'm sure you would find it difficult to resist pointing out to that person at least some of the many ways in which the teaching, as a deduction from combining various threads of separate teaching, is not only a very, very important one, but a blindingly obvious one. So Carl just starts off by saying, you know, you've, you've said that you don't, we don't need to respond, but actually we do need, you're a Christian brother, yeah. you, there's a big yeah. hole in, you, in the way you're looking at this theology, scripture here, and we need to, to respond to that. Right, yeah. He continues, he says um, a little bit later on, for example, the implications of having bloodshed, disease, suffering before the fall, which is what long ageism must imply, since fossils show these things, then if they are millions of years old, it means that they predated Adam and hence the fall slash the curse. And it then also means that rejecting the clear teaching of a global, you're rejecting the clear teaching of the global nature of the flood. That's what we've just talked about this right. last half hour. You know what's really puzzling to me in this feedback? Right, the first, the first uh, sentence, I'm an evangelist. If you're an evangelist and you're going to talk to people, because I've done this before, you go, you know, you're, you're witnessing to people on the yep. street, passing tracks or whatever. How can you not come across the number one objection to the Christian faith? The number one objection to the Christian faith, you'll hear evangelists always talk about, if you've got such a loving God, how come there's so much right. death yep. and suffering and pain and bloodshed in the world? If your God's so loving, you're talking about Jesus, how he, he saves and all this. How, how do you defend that in an old earth paradigm where yeah. God supposedly yeah. created over billions of years of death and struggle and pain and cancer? That's we the way he created. We just talked about that a couple, couple weeks ago. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you're trying to share the gospel about how we can be saved from the curse that happened at the fall of Adam. It's just a, it's just a, a huge blind spot for me when, I, when I'm looking at this. Yeah, from, it doesn't work. Yep. Um, Creation Magazine is a fantastic faith-building tool that has lots of evidence for a global flood, recent creation, that kind of thing. You can, you can peruse through a free digital copy online. Go to creation.com slash free mag. Yep. Now, next week, we're going to talk about atheism, how it requires evolution. Exactly. Thank you. See you again.